I love the Bible. It's a pretty odd thing to hear a minister say, isn't it? Most of you are probably thinking one of two things. Of course he loves the Bible. He's a minister. Or, thank goodness he finally said it. I was beginning to wonder. But I love the Bible because of stories like this. I love the Bible because stories like this offer so many different lessons. I mean, I bet I could preach on this one story about Jesus walking on the water for eight or ten weeks in a row, and every week would be different. But don't worry, I'm not going to. But if I think back to the sermons that I've preached on this passage in the past, they have generally focused on two different themes. The need to get out of the boat, in a well-intentioned and perhaps helpful invitation to hearers to take on risks in their personal and congregational lives, or the need to keep our eyes on Jesus in another well-intentioned and perhaps helpful invitation to greater piety and devotion and belief. And here's the thing. Both of these approaches are absolutely supported by this passage and they are legitimate choices. Peter does indeed get out of the boat and only flounders when he focuses on the tempest around him instead of his beckoning Lord before him. But having said that, this morning I want to explore something different and I want to continue my theme from the children's story because I think we want and need something more than simply good advice. And that something more is a recognition of, first, the power of the fear in this passage and in our lives. And second, the even greater power of promise, again in this passage and in our lives. Peter doesn't just flounder because he takes his eyes off Jesus, but because he grows afraid. And quite, quite frankly, that fear is justified. I mean, it's a storm for heaven's sakes, raging powerfully enough to sink the boat, let alone drown a single person out in the waves. He has, in other words, a perfectly good reason to be afraid. And a first century audience, they would have understood what we may miss, which is the utter terror of the waves unleashed from their boundaries. If we think about it, in creation, the story of creation, God separated the waters with a dome above and below the earth. There was the ever-present fear that broken boundaries could unleash the chaotic waters of creation. We have the story of Noah and the flood that destroyed an entire population and for the first century audience it was still a communal memory. The potential danger that water represents. Now, us as modern hearers, we also appreciate the awesome and dangerous power of water. It wasn't that long ago that the word tsunami became part of our vocabulary and it still induces us to an awareness of the sudden and unpredictable danger of water. And while the Sea of Galilee is certainly no ocean, it is known for how quickly and how dangerously winds and storms can arise. And so, after a night-long battle against the waves and the wind, the disciples were understandably afraid. And when they saw Jesus walking towards them, they were terrified. They didn't recognize him and they cried out in fear. And Jesus identifies himself and addresses their fear and says, fear not, do not be afraid. It's very biblical, isn't it? The angel says, fear not to Mary in the gospel of Luke. A young man in white says, fear not to the woman, women at the empty tomb in the gospel of Mark. The resurrected Jesus says fear not to the women as they leave the empty tomb in the Gospel of Matthew. Do not be afraid is a word of divine assurance in the midst of danger and fear whenever there is cause to be afraid. And we still have cause to fear, don't we? Whether it's a fear of a return of an illness, whether it's fear over the stability of a relationship, or of loneliness after a loss, of not being accepted by those that we hold in high esteem, or whether we'll fare well in a new chapter of our lives or in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. You name it, there is a lot of fear, a lot of reasons for fear as individuals, as a congregation, as a country, as a world. 
And fear, fear can be debilitating. It sneaks up on us, it paralyzes us, it makes us difficult to, to have any momentum in our lives. We lose all confidence. Fear is one of the primary things that rob the children of God of the abundant life that God intends for us. And so for this reason, I tend to take Jesus' words to the disciples near the end of the passage in verse 31. I take it more as a lament than as a rebuke, which is how it is often heard or read. Let me read it to you again in both ways so that you can feel the difference. The first I will read it as a rebuke and the second time I will read it as a lament. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? Did you feel the difference? If you remember the children's story, I told you that one of my favorite places to be at camp is at the high ropes course. I love watching people overcome their fear, and I love watching them accomplish things that they never thought possible. I remember one tiny little girl climbing the rock wall. She had only got about five feet off the ground the first two times she tried before she gave in to her fear and gave up. On her third try, Myself and her counselor, who was acting as her belayer, we began to shout encouragement to her as she was about to give up. You can do it. One more. Grab that next one. It's just up there by your hand. And she did. And she got a little higher. But our shouts of attention, or our shouts rather, got the attention of some of her cabin mates. And when she was about to give up again, a few of her friends, they shouted along with us, encouraging her. Keep going. You can do it and she kept climbing. And when she was about to give up a third time, her entire cabin was there, shouting and encouraging her to go higher. You can do it. And she did. She made it two thirds of the way up the rock wall. And I don't know who was prouder or happier, her or all of the people watching. I also remember one boy of about 12 you could tell he was terrified of heights as they were preparing, as they were putting on all the safety equipment, the vests and the helmets. But he was not going to tell the rest of the boys in his cabin. Finally, after a lot of encouragement from his counselor and some of his friends, he made it up the rope net climb. I happened to see him with his mother at the end of camp when the kids were getting picked up and overheard his mother asking him specifically about the high ropes course. She knew he was afraid of heights. Did you climb? Did you do it? How did it go? And as only a 12-year-old boy can say, yeah, mom, and rolled his eyes and walked away. I discreetly walked up behind that mother and told her what he had did. She started to cry. And she told me how he was so worried before he came to camp that his fear of heights would make him look bad in front of his cabin mates. In response to Peter's fear, Jesus doesn't simply urge him to courage or instruct Peter to keep his eyes on him. No, when Peter begins to sink, Jesus reaches out and grabs him, saves him from drowning, and restores him to his vocation as a disciple. And so it is with us. Jesus will not let us go. Jesus is with us. Jesus will not give up on us. Jesus will grab a hold of us when we falter and restore us to where we can be of service. This is the promise that is at the very heart of this story, that it is at the very heart of all of Matthew's gospel and indeed at the very heart of our faith, that God will never give up, that God is with us and for us, that God in the end will do what we cannot. And this promise is the one thing I know of that helps us cope and transcend fear. I notice I said transcend, not defeat. Because fear is a part of our lives and we should take care that being fearful is not equated with faithlessness. Because courage, after all, isn't the absence of fear, but the ability to take our stand and do what needs to be done even when we're afraid. I can't help but think of the firefighters rushing into a fire because that's what their training has taught them to do. 
They know that they're trained. They're n they know that they have safety equipment. They know that they have water and people backing them up. But they're still afraid. Even the promise of comfort and courage and presence doesn't quite exhaust the potential of this story. Because of all that is, finally, a part of God's larger promise and vision of what we might be, of the person God sees us as and calls us to be, of the hopes and dreams that God has for us as individuals and as communities. And that, I think, is the something more for which we long, the belief. And remember, belief always stems from promise. We long for the belief that our story isn't over, that there is more to us than perhaps has been seen so far, that the past doesn't determine our future, that our faults and our failings don't disqualify us from the love and acceptance and hope that God offers. When the disciples are terrified, Jesus calls for them to take heart. And when Peter flails and cries out to be saved, Jesus reaches out and grabs him. The future is open because God is with us and for us. God will do what we cannot. Nothing that we have done or has been done to us can erase God's desire and ability to save and restore us. For God is not done with us yet. And that, my friends, is the good news that God's promise and actions to overcome our fears and send us out armed with courage and confidence to live and share God's abundant life. For while fear remains a powerful part of our lives, God's promise and God's vision is more powerful still. Amen. Our hymn, number 451, Dear Father, Lord of Humankind.